Little Board Gaming Night here and today I'm going to be reviewing the prehistoric board game Dinosaur World. Let me go ahead and give you an overhead view of the table so you get a rough idea of how much table space this game requires. And I will let you know right off the bat, you need a lot of table space to be able to fit this game on top of it. It demands a whole lot of space and you really just need to know that before this review even kicks off. With that out of the way, let's go ahead and take a look at the box and the components inside. The box art of Dinosaur World seems like it ripped every single action movie you've ever seen and placed it on top of the box. It actually looks really cool and action packed. The back of the box shows you everything that's contained within the box itself. Unfortunately, as with most board games I own, it didn't all fit back in the box. I had to use this craft box to be able to place all the components inside of it. Now there is some warping when it comes to the, the boards that the game uses, but other than that, the component quality of Dinosaur World is really top notch and some really good stuff. It's great. At first glance, the rule book seemed incredibly intimidating. Thankfully, the rulebook contained several illustrations along with examples that really helped me learn how to play the game and made setup pretty painless and easy to do, although it takes some time to set it up. Unfortunately, the player reference cards included in the base game have misprinted information on here and it's actually on one of the more crucial parts of the game itself when it comes to the public and private actions. Thankfully, you can go ahead and download the updated version, which corrects the issues that were found with the previous player references. There are five different phases that you have to go through to complete each round. For solo, you get to use two specialists that aid you throughout your journey. You also receive an AI deck that actually creates all sorts of chaos in your park. You draw eight AI cards and that becomes your objectives that you have to complete throughout the game. Thankfully, you're allowed to remove three of them to help make your game easier. At the start of the round, you draw an AI card. From there, the AI card is going to show you everything that it's going to do to go against you. After that, you draw a card from the worker database. You actually have to draw two and choose one. From there, you grab those meeples from the supply and add them to your board. The first icon in the AI card is going to tell you how to move any escaped dinosaurs on the map. The icons below that is going to be how the dinosaurs that are in your paddocks are going to escape and where they're going to move. Escaped dinosaurs will be replaced with escape markers. The next icon is going to let you know how many DNA dice you're going to draw from the dice bag. Simply draw that amount of dice from the dice bag, give them a roll, and place them in the middle of the playing area. During the public actions phase, you can gather DNA by choosing a DNA dice from the board, and depending how many meeples you use, you get to gain all the DNA icons multiplied by the number of workers you spent and simply increase the DNA that you gathered. You can also purchase a dinosaur paddock by using any two meeples of any color plus the price or the coins that it costs to purchase the paddock. You can find the cost on the upper left corner. You can also use a green meeple That'll give you a bonus by actually reducing the cost by one, giving you an opportunity to even have a chance to get a free tile. From there, simply add it to the board. Just remember, when purchasing a dinosaur paddock, you can never place dinosaur paddocks adjacent to each other. Next, you can purchase an attraction simply pay the printed costs located on the upper left hand corner of the attraction and add it to your park. You can never have more than one of each attraction in your park. 
Keep that in mind. You can also purchase a special building by spending a meeple of any color plus the printed cost of the tile you want to purchase located on the upper left hand corner and simply adding it to your park. Some tiles have an immediate action located on the upper right hand corner of the tile followed by VP points. When that happens simply gain that amount of VP point printed on the tile. Next come the private actions. Your player board is going to show all the private actions available to you during this phase. Using one meeple of any color you can refine DNA. You refine DNA by either using basic DNA to form advanced DNA or by breaking down an advanced DNA and gaining basic DNA. There's a chart on the player board that will let you know how to refine each DNA available to you. You can receive funding by spending a meeple of any color and receiving the printed amount of coins in that slot. You can also spend a green meeple to receive that amount of printed coin plus a bonus additional coin. You can never use more than three meeples on any given action. You can spend a meeple of any color to increase the security by one. However, if you use a yellow meeple to increase your security, you decrease the cost by one potentially giving you a free security. You can spend a meeple of any color to upgrade your Jeepo garage. However, if you use a purple meeple to upgrade your Jeepo garage, you get to reduce the cost of upgrading that zone by one. When upgrading a meeple garage and reaching a new zone, immediately gain the root token that belongs to that zone and add it to your root token supply. Then choose a bonus token of your choosing and place it in the slot next to that upgraded zone. Immediately gain the bonus printed on the bonus token. You can spend one meeple of any color to make a dinosaur. The top center of the dinosaur paddock indicates how much DNA you have to spend to create the dinosaur. The slot may sometimes also have an additional cost as well. Simply spend the DNA required to create the dinosaur, look for the meeple that belongs to that tile. Before you place it, make sure you add any threat and regain any victory points for creating the dinosaur. Place the dinosaur in that pad, raise your threat, and after that, go to your victory board and gain the victory points for creating that dinosaur. Next comes the Jeeple Tour. During this phase, you get to use the root tokens that you've been able to gain through your Jeeple Garage to be able to move your Jeeple around the map, hopefully gaining excitement and victory points along the way. Use your root token, decide where and which tile you want to move to, grab your meeple and move to that tile. There's a few steps you have to know to activate each tile you land on with your meeple. To activate a tile, you're going to need to spend a meeple of whatever color is printed on that tile. From there, you place the worker and immediately gain the excitement printed below. Raise your excitement level on the excitement board. And from there, add a boredom token. In this case, I use a die. I went ahead and placed one boredom token on there. That lets me know that every time I come and spend a meeple here, I'm going to gain excitement minus the amount of boredom indicated on the boredom token. You can have a maximum of five boredom 
on each tile. And every time you revisit that same tile, you increase boredom. You're then able to take the action printed on the tile. In this case, I will get one excitement for every tile that's adjacent to this. In this case, there's a total of four excitement that I'll earn for activating this tile. From there, you can keep using root tokens to move along the map. You do not have to activate the tiles that you land on if you don't want to. You could simply just go ahead, add another root token, and move on to the next tile. In this case, I landed on a dinosaur paddock. You don't need to use a, a meeple to activate it. You just immediately gain whatever excitement is printed on there, add it to your excitement level, and add or increase the boredom token. Dinosaur paddocks have danger rolls that need to be done when, you, when they're activated. Simply grab the matching die color, give it a roll. If it's blank, no casualties were suffered during that tour. However, if you roll a casualty, you're gonna add that amount of deaths to your player board and keep track of them. Casualties decrease the score that you earn at the end of the game. When playing solo, you have to roll the three danger die. This represents the casualties that the AI suffered during its Jeeple tour. Simply add the amount of casualties and subtract it by one. That will indicate the amount of casualties that the AI suffered during their Jeeple tour. Add it to the center area to keep track of it for the end game. It really does affect the scoring at the end. The final phase is the income and cleanup phase. Return your Jeeple to the welcome center. From there, pick up all of the root tokens that you have placed on the map and return them to your supply located near your player board. You now get to gain all the bonuses you received from your bonus tokens. In this case, you increase the security by one for free, and you also add two coin to your supply. Gain the amount of coin located underneath your excitement level. In this case, I gained six coins. From there, I reset my excitement level back down to zero. Remove the meeples that you spent and placed on your board and put them back into their supply. Next, check the threat and security level. If the threat is equal to or less than the security, you do not suffer casualties. However, if your threat is greater than your security, you receive one casualty for every threat that's above your security. If there's any DNA dice on the board, remove it and return it to the dice bag. The AI card is gonna determine how many special building tiles and how many dinosaur paddock tiles you're gonna discard from the board. In this example, I have to discard three dinosaur paddocks from the board. I then replenish the empty spaces on the board from the dinosaur paddock stack. If the dinosaur paddock stack ever runs out of tiles, I simply grab the discard pile, shuffle them, and create a new dinosaur paddock stack. The AI card also stated that I needed to discard three special building tiles. Once you discard the tiles, you have to shift the remaining tile back down along the line. And as I did with the dinosaur paddock, I'm gonna refill each of the empty spaces using the stack of special buildings. If the special building stack ever runs out, you do not get to reshuffle the discard pile. If the special building 
tiles on the board run out, you can no longer purchase special building tiles. From there, we go to the round marker. This excitement level with the zero here is just a reminder that you have to reset your excitement level back down to zero. Once you do that, move your round marker to the next round and keep doing that for five rounds until you end the game. Once the fifth round ends, follow the instructions on how to tally your points. If you played solo and you used any of the survival cards, you do not get to earn the victory points printed on the lower right hand corner. Then you simply look at the results and that's how you play Dinosaur World. If you're interested in playing Dinosaur World, there's something that you really need to know. There are two versions of Dinosaur World, the retail version and the Kickstarter version. What you see here is actually the Kickstarter version and there's a few things that are different from the Kickstarter versus the retail version. First of all, in the Kickstarter edition, every single meeple that the dinosaurs have are going to have an imprinted image of the dinosaur on the meeple. When you buy it just off of retail, it's going to just have basic colors, no picture or anything on there. Another thing you need to know, it does not include a solo mode if you buy it off of retail. The only way that you could play the solo mode is either through the actual Kickstarter or on the Pandasaurus website, there is an add-on pack or an expansion pack that uh, actually includes everything that was inside of the actual Kickstarter as well as the AI cards that you need to be able to play solo. This is really important and I really need to let you know this before you just rush off and buy the game. All right, with that out of the way, I actually want to talk about how I felt about certain mechanics of Dinosaur World. And one of the mechanics I want to bring to your attention actually have to do with the AI cards for solo play. And the reason that is, is it has a really neat mechanic that has to do with escaped dinosaurs. You do not see this mechanic when you're playing with other people, and I actually feel that it should have been included because it actually makes the gameplay really fun. When you're playing solo, you're going to have you're going to be playing these AR AI cards and these AI cards are going to have a whole bunch of different iconographies down here in the bottom. There's two sides, an objective side, which is how you're going to set up your objectives, and there's an actual AI side. But right now we're going to focus on the AI side. These arrows here are going to let you know how your dinosaurs that are in the park are going to react depending if there's an escaped dinosaur or not for example if there were if there would be an escaped dinosaur here that icon right here will let you know which direction that dinosaur is going to move to on the other on the flip side the red arrows will actually let you know how each dinosaur from a paddock is going to escape. And only one dinosaur from each paddock can escape. In this example, let's say right here, the Velociraptor, it can even, it could either escape uh, southwest if there's a tile. In this case, there's not a tile, so the Velociraptor will not be able to escape there. Or it will try to escape northeast. And once again, there's not a tile north, northeast of the Velociraptor, so they also would not escape from there. However, you have to do that to each of your dinosaur paddocks that you own. And if you go over here, for example, it'll show you south, uh, southwest. Can that dinosaur escape to the southwest? Yes, it can. And it will leave its paddock. You would place an escape marker on that on that section where the dinosaur belonged and the dinosaur would escape. 
And that is one of the actual mechanics that really does a good job keeping you on your toes and constantly changing your strategy. Because during the meeple phase, what you're gonna have to do when you were, you're gonna have to drive to whichever location an escaped dinosaur is on, and by spending one of your meeples that you have in hand, you get to return any escaped dinosaur back to the respective paddock. So you have to do that. There, if you have three escaped dinosaurs, you're gonna have to be finding a way uh, figuring out how you're going to be able to return those dinosaurs back to their paddocks. And that is what brings, at least for the solo portion of this game, a lot of strategy. And I found it genuinely enjoyable. It never bothered me. It never frustrated me. It just kept me visiting different parts of the map. And although boredom tokens, which I use little dice to show uh, to represent the boredom on, on the tiles. Boredom tokens are used so that as you keep traveling through the, the park, instead of you just using the same path and traveling through that same path over and over again, these boredom tokens say, okay, every time you revisit it, you're gonna, you, the, the rewards are going to be less and you may even have to suffer some excitement level if you keep revisiting it. So the boredom tokens are a, a mechanic that avoid you from just taking the same path, but at the same time, the escape dinosaur gameplay mechanic actually serves a different purpose, but much the same way. The difference being is you might have to cross a path of, of, a, of a tile that already has a high a high boredom uh, token number because you have no other choice. There's a dinosaur that you have to bring back to their paddock and it's getting close to the end game. And if any dinosaurs remain escaped, you're going to lose some VP for that. And uh, that's one of the more exciting and enjoyable aspects for me personally. I like how the boredom tokens kind of work together with the dinosaurs escaping gameplay. It really works well. It meshes with the theme and what the game is trying to accomplish in a way that you're going to be playing every game differently. And as you keep playing more and more, you're going to keep coming up with different strategies, different ideas. You're going to start to learn what the tiles do better. And you're going to be able to understand which tiles you want to look for. And not only will that help you score better, but it keeps the game from feeling stale. But another thing the game throws your way so that the game does not get stale are, once again, if we go back to the AI cards, the car, same cards that move those dinosaurs, there you are going to choose eight of these cards in the beginning of the game, but instead of using the AI portion, what you're going to use is the objective portion. And this is gonna let you know what objectives you have to complete in order to earn these victory points. And one really cool thing about it is on, on the bottom right hand side, it'll show you that if you get it done before round two in this example, you will earn an additional five VP. So all the cards here are face down, that's because I have completed them. But in the beginning of the game, they're actually face up. And although you draw eight cards in the beginning, you, the game allows you to remove three of those cards because at the end of the game, any objective that you did not complete is going to take away 10 victory points per objective that was left uncompleted. Once again... Another mechanic that keeps you on your toes, that keeps you thinking and building your park differently because every objective is going to have you forming the park in a different way. If you noticed, uh, this park, although I have some dinosaurs here, is not really dinosaur centric. And one of the big reasons why it's not dinosaur centric is because a lot of, uh, a lot of the objectives that I had here, 
really had more to do with special buildings. And I was focusing on having certain special buildings so that I would not fail the, those objectives and lose victory points at the end of the game. But you may play a different game that might give you a lot of objectives that are, are very dino dinosaur-centric. And then what you're going to be needing to worry at, at, at that time will actually be with the actual threat level. Because if you don't have enough security to, to negate or balance out the threat level, you're going to be getting a lot of deaths in your park. And once again, that's going to take away from your final score at the end of the game. What I'm trying to uh, uh, convey to you is that I, I really think that Dinosaur World did a phenomenal job keeping the game changing so that it doesn't feel stale, so you never feel like you're going out and doing the same thing over and over again. This is actually future me interjecting. I wanted to add one more thing. I also enjoyed the way the game actually kept things fresh by constantly having you go through your tiles, refreshing them in a way by discarding tiles constantly so you could see a lot of tiles throughout your game. And the way it does it is through the actual AI card itself, it lets you know right here how many special buildings in this case, four, four special buildings will be discarded and new built special building tiles will take its place. And right next to it, it'll let you know three dinosaur paddocks are going to be discarded and then refreshed with new, with new tiles. Now, if you ever run out of dinosaur uh, tile paddock tiles what you do you shuffle them and then put them back here this is just how it was at the end of my last game i just left it at that way so uh, whenever you run out of dino paddocks you reshuffle the discard pile and refresh it however when it comes to the actual special buildings you do not reshuffle you do not refresh it once you're once they're out with that once that tile is depleted it's over you cannot get any more tiles from the special buildings. And that's it, back to the review. But on that same coin, I'm gonna have to actually let you know about something. I, I did not include the expansion packs here, but there's quite a few different expansions that you could add to Dinosaur World. And although I do not recommend you adding these expansions during your first few games, they are not difficult. They add enough to the game without over complicating things. And what it makes the game feel is constantly fresh. It makes it feel like something new is coming out at all times. You have to handle creating dinosaurs differently. If you do, if you if you use the hybrid pack, for example, this one has dinosaurs that have two different species. Uh, there's um, there's an Ice Age pack, and the Ice Age pack is cool because although you cannot put two two dinosaurs next to each other, two dinosaur paddocks next to each other, this is not considered a dinosaur paddock. So you could actually place this next to dinosaurs, and if you look at the corners uh, at the edges of the tile, it lets you know at the end of the game if you have this type this building in this tile or sometimes they'll say if you have this type of dinosaur next to the tile here you score extra points at the end of the game and i really really enjoy that and really quick it also helps you get higher scores at the end too <laughs> i just wanted to add that uh then they have a water pack and water the water pack introduces water-based dinosaurs and once again this one brings a mechanic that has to, a lot to do with algae and the algae you have to clean it and remove it but then you could turn that algae into uh, dinosaur dna so although it's a headache much the same of like similar to how escape dinosaur works uh that's how the water the the water pack works but my point is you could either add as many expansions to the game or as little as you want and what it does it keeps the game feeling fresh because it's constantly throwing different dinosaurs your way and there's a whole bunch of other diff uh, dinosaurs that come with those expansions a whole bunch of different tiles and a whole bunch of different ways to approach the situations that the games that the game throws at you and personally 
in my opinion, I strongly recommend finding at least one or two of the expansion packs if you decide to play this game. Uh, because it really does add another layer to the game and it, it's, it's going to keep the game feeling much more replayable for a much longer amount of time. And that's just my opinion. Towards the beginning of the video, I already showed you how a round plays out and you just pretty much keep doing that for five times until the game finishes. Now, overall, I will let you know that I really enjoyed this game. Normally, I usually play uh, campaign style games, games with a story. Uh, I don't have that many beat your score games. I do have some, but I don't have many. But I will say that this is probably one of the better beat your score type of games that I own. I, 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 I had a lot of fun with it, but it didn't blow my, it didn't rock my world either. This was a game that is highly enjoyable. It looks really nice, although it takes up just way too much space. I love the theme. I love the, the building your dinosaur park. That is, that, that was really fun to do and just figuring out how you're going to handle all the different types of tiles that come out and how you're going to try to prevent certain dinosaurs from creating havoc in your park and destroying your well-laid plans is, is part of what makes this game just so enjoyable. And as a solo game, if you have the expansions, I definitely think that this is a game that if, if you enjoy uh, beat your own score type games, this is a, a, a must play. This is a, a must have game in that regard. For me, I'm glad that I have it in my collection. It is not my favorite board game, but it is a board game that I enjoy playing. And if you enjoyed what you saw here, it may be right for you. The sensation that Dinosaur World gives you in, in having to come up with different strategies on the fly to maintain your park and avoid complete chaos and havoc is something that really calls to me. It really had me enjoying what I was playing every time that I was playing it. And I guess that's the best way I could describe how this game is. It's perfect chaos almost because you're dealing with so many things at once. Nothing ever goes right nothing ever goes your way and it's up to you to find a solution on how to fix it and make it better with that said i just want to let you know once again i enjoyed it i had a great time with dinosaur world this is solo board gaming night thank you so much for joining me and i hope you have a great game night take care